Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I am Mariam Zia. In today's program, we will be talking about uh, some recent developments uh, that are involving India. Of course, we will be talking about the recent announcement uh, by Afghan embassy that it is going to be seizing its operations uh, in India uh, from October uh, 1st. And what are the reasons behind this and how India and Afghanistan's relations are going to be impacting the region and regional security. We will also be talking about another chilling incident involving Indian government. Of course, uh, we will be talking about uh, the claims of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, that Indian government is involved in killing of a Sikh separatist uh, leader, Sikh independence leader Hardeep Singh. Uh, what are the implications of uh, this development uh, on the region at large? And we will also be talking about uh, the growing extremism and fascism of Indian government. Uh, of course, we know that it has been a long term dream of Indian right wing uh, to make India uh, that was uh, previously a plural and a diverse country uh, to a Hindu state. What it means for the region, what are, going, uh, what are the strategic implications of these developments for the region and regional security and what needs to be done uh, to address this extremism. We will be talking about all this in today's program. To discuss this and more, we are joined in the studios by Brigadier Hamid Malik. Welcome to the program. We are also joined by Mr. Sheryar Khan. Welcome to the program and we are joined online by Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal, who is expert in national affairs. Welcome to the program. Uh, of course, uh, Brigadier Malik, let me start with you. Um, this recent development that uh, Afghan, Afghanistan uh, has announced to seize its operations in India, how significant is this development and, uh, and what are the reasons and what are the factors that led to this announcement? Thank you very much, Mariam. And, uh First of all, we must uh, know that India is not the a country which want to sponsor and have peace in the region. And if we see Afghanistan-India relation, Afghanistan present government by Taliban has not been recognized by India. And its diplomatic relations with the previous government diplomats being stationed in uh, Delhi, I think were not justified. Mm. And what we see that the Afghan uh, diplomats, they blame India that the host country is not providing them all the facilities and freedom of move. And they have also accused India that they wanted to have uh, the interest of the 40,000 recognized refugees in Afghan uh, refugees in India to be taken care of, which they think that with the present Indian mindset, and which is very hegemonic and fascist in nature because of their Hindutva mindset and BGP is following the RSS mentality that I India is only for the Hindus. They feel that their refugees' safety and security and their interests are not being safeguarded and they are failing in ensuring the interests being safeguarded. And because this also shows the strained diplomatic relationship between Afghanistan and India. And now what we see that the reasons First reason is that India is not recognizing the popular government in Afghanistan by the Taliban. Mm. Whereas after the Doha talks, it is a legitimate government in Afghanistan and even America, Pakistan, Iran, China, even Russia has also acknowledged that the present government in Afghanistan should ensure peace and all the neighbors should also support Afghanistan present setup that they are going to have some normalcy in Afghanistan because the regional connectivity which we talk of, of and which will give boost to the economies of the neighboring countries and will go for the human development, it needs peace in Afghanistan and the present government, if supported in Afghanistan, can do that. Mm. But we see India is a game spoiler again. Mm. India is a bad boy of the region. Let me acknowledge and say it openly because instead of supporting the other countries to have normalcy, peace. And another reason that India is not supporting the present government is that the previous government has allowed India to be in line to stage terrorism in Pakistan yes. through their aid consulate which was just supporting Pakistan border. And they were uh, supporting TTP that is Taliban, Tariqe Taliban Pakistan and Bloch Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of casualties being suffered by Pakistan. And now the present government in Afghanistan has openly said and acknowledged that Afghan side will not be used for terrorism by any country which doesn't suit India. Hmm. And that is the reason India is not supporting the present government to have an embassy in India right. and safeguard their interests and also have diplomatic relations which are based on both sides' sovereignty 
and dignity of each country. Of course. Uh, Mr. Shahyar, in your opinion, what are some of the regional and geopolitical factors that have influenced uh, this decision, especially when uh, we see it in the context of uh, uh, India's relations with Afghanistan? So, Mariam, like this whole uh, uh, situation, which is like very embarrassing for India, this has basically resulted from the ambiguous uh, stance of the Indian government rather than any geopolitics uh, of the region. So, in April, 25, uh, 25th April, if I remember correctly, uh, the acting foreign minister of uh, Afghanistan, Amir Muttaki, he basically wrote a letter to the uh, Afghan embassy in India. And he basically said that Qadir Khan, who is basically a, a trade counselor in uh, the embassy, he basically promoted him as charity affairs. And this is like in line because now there is a new government in uh, Afghanistan and they want their representation to represent them in of India. Of course. Because of the, uh, the ambiguous and like uh, close-minded stance of the Indian government, this whole power struggle started emerging in the embassy and this started in April. In May, uh, Mr. Qadir Khan, he wrote a letter to Indian Foreign Ministry that I have taken over as the charge the affairs and the diplomats over there, because they were, you know, close to the uh, previous government or the Ashraf Ghani regime, they basically rejected this claim and they basically fired Mr. Qadir Khan, which was very embarrassing for the host uh, country as well. And now, uh, everyone was basically looking at India on to like make a decision on, you know, which of these two persons or gentlemen will be the ambassador hmm. of the new republic of uh, Afghanistan and India didn't like say anything. So this is like one of the reasons why this escalated to a point that now the embassy had to be closed and for a host country this is a very embarrassing situation and now India needs to like step up and this like ambiguous stance will not like work any further and it will curtail the interests of all regional uh, you know stakeholders that are trying to stabilize Afghanistan. Of course. Uh, the uh, everyone wants peace and security in Afghanistan and now security peace regional connectivity regional economics it's all you know lying you know um, we're waiting for like India to like take a you know decisive step on recognizing or you know like even de facto government hmm. they don't have to like it they don't have to like agree with their stance they don't have to agree with the but way but to acknowledge the effect of authority of the taliban you know, or the present government yeah. uh, dr Rispal, uh, let me come to you of course uh, when we talk about uh, pakistan pakistan has a shared border with afghanistan uh, what 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 policy should pakistan be taking when we talk about specifically about the diplomatic strategy of pakistan with regards to uh, this recent development of closure of Afghan embassy in India? I think that uh, we have to take into account the regional and global politics into context. For instance, when the Afghan uh, uh, embassy has been closed in India, there is a reason behind it. The reason is that if you see, Pakistan has been now exercising a full pressure on Afghanistan so that the Afghans can assist Pakistan in naming, or you can say, curtailing the activities of the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, a Daesh group, which we call it Islamic State of Khorasan and Bloch Liberation. All these three groups have been receiving assistance, material and financial assistance from the India on the Afghanistan territory. So naturally, when the Afghanistan government is now cooperating with Pakistan, it is going to nab down these uh, groups or refrain these activities and especially controlling or stopping the Indians uh, in, uh, assistance to these groups in Afghanistan. That's why the Indians have apprehended and they stopped this. And they said, otherwise, if the recognition was the issue, then why they did not close this embassy two years back? Right. So, of course, of course. And um, this closure of uh, embassy is also important because uh, one third of the my, uh, immigrants or the refugees in India are Afghan. Uh, are of Afghan origin. So do you think Pakistan's border with Afghanistan is going to be uh, an uh, issue or maybe uh, we can see some flow of mig migrants from Afghanistan to Pakistan as well and how uh, the other countries in the neighborhood are going to be impacted by this development? I think uh, this is an eye-opener for the world also. Mm. As my also colleague highlighted that this is one of the failure of India, not Afghanistan. Mm. While the Afghan present government by the Taliban, they are openly saying and making statement they want peace in Afghanistan and peace around the neighbors also. And I think India is not supporting 
as such. And as you have also very correctly highlighted, there are migrants, uh, one migrants in India. And I think their present uh, life and safety is at stake. And that is why the Indian, uh, the Afghan diplomats also highlighted that they are unable to safeguard the interest of the refugees in India. Mm -hmm. And with present mindset of uh, the Hindutva and Modi also, what we see that they just want India to be named as Hindustan, that is a place for only Hindus. Mm -hmm. And with that mindset, the lives of the Muslims, Christians, Sikhs are not safe. And I am also, uh, I think, uh, worried that the lives of the Afghan mm -hmm. Im immigrants there will be difficult and will be in the passage of time, as you said, that there will be influx of those migrants going back to Afghanistan. And India can use those by blackmailing, by brainwashing to stage terrorism in Pakistan. That is a fear and a threat. We, we must reckon and must start preparing to address that. And I think the Afghan present government will be with us to ensure that their land is not used for harboring any terrorist act, either in Pakistan or in other neighboring countries. And I think the world should come over mm -hmm. and should also ensure that Indian such hegemonic diplomatic attitude doesn't prevail for the other regions also. Mm. But Birgir Malik, when we talk about terrorism, of course, uh, these are vulnerable populations and yeah. they are easy target for extremism and, of course, terrorism as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, what kind of measures should be taken by Pakistan as well as the other neighboring countries? And also when we talk about international organizations and multilateral organizations mm. as well uh, to address uh, these emerging challenges. I think first of all is the border control. And I think in the past few years, Pakistan has done a very wonderful job and all credit goes to Pakistan Army. True. We must appreciate that they have taken a lead and they have now fenced almost all the borders with the Afghanistan. And uh, they are also ensuring that the, all the uh, border crossing points, there is a data which is being kept, who is entering and who is leaving. And I think uh, only the bona fide and justified people, if they are allowed uh, to come in Pakistan, and, uh, but still, there are certain places from where certain terrorists are still staging activities and for that we have to take certain more measures. Mm -hmm. that, and as far as the world and international community is concerned, mm -hmm. I think main onus is on them. They must realize that the world has suffered a lot from the global terrorism mm -hmm. in the past 20, 25 years. And this is a time where they must focus on mm. human development also, human security Should also. Should Pakistan be engaging with those org uh, organizations, keeping in mind the recent development, of course, because we are in the neighborhood mm. and we have a shared border. And we previously had a large population of these surely, immigrants as well. Surely, if we come out to the region, we have Shanghai Cooperation Organization available. We have SARC available. And SARC, again, because of the Indian hegemonic designs and sinister mindset, is has been almost made dysfunctional. And but still we have a security council also available, which is very effective, which is, I think, must take action about that. They must ensure that certain terrorist activities being sponsored by any country should be taken seriously and certain measures should be adopted against that country. And I think this is also one of the classical case which should be taken up by the UN and by also Shanghai Cooperation Organization to ensure that the safety and security of the neighboring countries should also be ensured and no country should be allowed to see a diplomatic relationship within the region. Mm. Whether uh, that government, now we see China, Russia, everybody is supporting peace in Afghanistan and it is only uh, India which is trying to have a turmoil in Afghanistan. And we all know that geostrategically how Afghanistan is important to the neighboring countries because of the regional connectivity, the economic development and human, uh, I think, uh, safety is more important. And mm. in that place, I think the international organization as well as the neighboring countries China and Russia should take a note of it. Of course, and uh, I want to move towards the other development, uh, uh, of course, about the killing of uh, Sikh independence leader Har Har Hardeep Singh uh, on Canadian soil. Uh, what are the details regarding this and uh, how does this impact uh, India's relations with Canada and also uh, the extremist mindset of Indian government and involvement of Indian security agencies in killing of, uh, you know, uh, in killing of citizens on other countries' soils, on other countries' democracy. Uh, so, Mariam, I, I would like very, very briefly, um, you know, tell you how this like whole incident has like impacted the whole international arena. Now, whenever a country basically makes an ex accusation of this magnitude, mm. I would say there's like a lot of research, a lot of 
work has been done in the background to basically gather enough evidence that you stand up you know in front of the world and you basically make an accusation to one of your close partners by the way you know not like a random country in the middle east or you know any other uh, you know area in the world so before this uh, announcement was made by you know uh, president trudeau prime minister trudeau there was like a lot of like research and a lot of investigations and they have like ample evidence and this evidence by the way has been provided by the firebys Okay. And there are like now a lot of like articles in American publications which basically say that the U.S. provided key information which basically led to the Canadian authorities to basically analyze that Indian intelligence agency was involved in this whole incident. Now, when we look at this incident and India's overconfidence, I would say, and aggression which is like now going beyond its borders, this is in retaliation, I would say, or this has been encouraged by India's own acts in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. That's where the Indian government started doing uh, forced disappearances. They started using pellet guns. They trampled all you know, human rights. And the world basically looked. And they basically said this is a personal matter, but mm. bilateral matter between India and Pakistan, even though there are UN resolutions over there. And the world basically overtook the economic compulsions of the world, overtook, and they basically let go of the human rights. This expanded into Afghanistan, where India basically moved out of its borders, mm -hmm. and they basically started using this strategy and promoting terrorism in Pakistan's uh, boundaries and Pakistan's, uh, you, know, um, you know, area. And now, this has like now moved to the West. And now the West is also feeling the heat of this aggression that has like now uh, permeated into their borders as well. And now will they like keep quiet? No, they can't. Five of the uh, key partners, which is the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, they have condemned this. Even the Americans have basically said that the India, Indians need to cooperate with the authorities of in course. Canada to basically come to a you know, justified end to this investigation. And now what India is doing in retaliation, India is like you know, kicking out their you know, um, diplomats. They have stopped issuing visas to Canadians to enter. So this is like now, uh, you know, going out of control. And India is like not even like admitting, or it, it was not even willing to uh, be a part of this investigation. And mm -hmm. now from the American pressure, now they're like giving statements that we are ready to, uh, you know, uh, explore and like see where this investigation would go. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Jaspal, India has always been involved in state-sponsored terrorism. When we talk about terrorism uh, in Pakistan, of course, Kulbhushan Jadev is uh, a key example in the recent times that we know of. Uh, but uh, the rise in extremism and this state-sponsored terrorism of uh, India has now gained international attention. Uh, so, how do you think this is going to be impacting uh, India's uh, diplomatic relations uh, with these countries and how this is going to be impacting or what consequences uh, does it hold for this region? I think that uh, India's Hindutva forces or Modi regime's uh, sponsored terrorism policies, they are now in full circle. They are impacting not only the region, I mean South Asia, they are impacting or they are having a repercussion for the entire world today. As we, it was very rightly pointed out, Earlier, with riding the Canada, but Australia has now very much seriously asked the Indians and they want and put to our forces that they should not only violence within the Canada and refrain from their activity. Similarly, because of this, United Kingdom has uh, now suspended its relations, especially which it was buying the cheap oil, which was uh, uh, from uh, Russian oil, in fact. Uh, from India, it has it's not distinct from itself. So the, it was earlier pointed out that the Americans have also launched a protest. Now we have to see India or the Modi government was building an image of the after G20 or these kind of things. All those images as a rising power, as a rule-based state, they have been vanished, and the world, which was not hearing our, uh, you can say, concerns, now they are talking and debating it. As a result of this, Indian diplomats are facing now threat or challenge in Canada, and India has now asked the Canadians to, out of their, what you call it, 41 diplomats, Canadian diplomats must go immediately and leave the country before October 10, because they, otherwise their immunity will be ended. 
So this rift between the Canadians and the Indians on the India-sponsored terrorism in Canada, it is going to, you can say, create a lot of problems for this regime. And at the same time, it establishes or confirm to the West or American-led world, which are very much nowadays, uh, you can say, appeasing India, that India has been involved in these kind of the activities within the region, in the neighboring states since long. So definitely now the time has come where the international community has to stop India from the state-sponsored terrorism. Of course, uh, India is involved in state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, how is the international community um, uh, catering to this issue? And also, uh, when we talk about the role of uh, intelligence agencies involved in uh, such kind of uh, operations or killings abroad, uh, is there some need for some kind of transparency or accountability for uh, keeping a track on these uh, state-sponsored crimes? I think uh, as far as the role of intelligences is concerned, there are certain limitations and obligations which are they supposed to follow. Mm. The biggest uh, intelligence, CIA, mm. is also notorious for violation of certain code of conduct. True. And I think Roy is following their footstep. And if we see Hadeep Singh assassination, there are few important aspects which need to be uh, understood by the European community which are the trumpet and trumpet of saying human rights and human safety and security. But here we see double standard by them. Mm. Their mute response is basically worrisome for all of us. Because uh, when they have credible evidence and they have also levered acquisitions against India, and they say that their serving intelligence officer is involved in the killing of cold blood murder of Ardeep Singh, there has to be certain investigation which should be brought out to the world hmm. and it should be brought to the uh, security council also to the all human rights organization world over also and there should be certain limitations and certain obligations which were supposed to be followed by India and India needs to be questioned about that. Hmm. And secondly what we see that from the non-state terrorism to the world is now moving to state sponsored terrorism and the consequences will be very gruesome and uh, world will be again destabilized because uh, India is following Israel's footstep of uh, using third countries file to settle the score mm. and I would call it it is kill at will which is not allowed in the world mm. because any if there was certain um, allegation by India it need to be investigated and there is a system of justice which need to be followed but killing at will will destabilize the world mm. what we see and in our case Kalbushan Jadav was having a test network in Pakistan killing innocent lives in Pakistan. Right, and Pakistan provide, provided dossiers as well. But Brigadier Malik, we see that uh, in the past decade, India has emerged as a key partner for United States as well. So how do you see uh, US response to this and how this is going to be evolving uh, in future and what kind of leverage does it uh, provide to Pakistan? A very important aspect, I must say, that this is the point where uh, US has to show that whether it's sports morality, at its forces on strategic interest mm. because uh, India is being used by US as a counterpart to the China. China and a counterweight also. And this is the point where they need to also show to their own domestic audience that they are following the principles of morality and any country mm -hmm. who is going to violate human rights or who is going to endanger human safety, they are going to stand against that. And what we see that in the past 10 years, if they have supported India, so it has also destabilized the region. It has not worked for the stabilization and peace in, in our region. Either it has worked as a destabilization factor. And But another important aspect we must reckon is that in Canada is a part of non-NATO NATO countries mm. organization, and which very specifically says if any countries land and sovereignty is being violated by any other country, a unanimous stand will be taken by all countries of NATO and mm. America being part of NATO and Canada neighbor also. The more responsibility stands on the shoulders of USA now. Mm. So, um, Mr. Sharyar, how is United States going to be uh, creating a balance uh, to strengthen its ties with its key partners, allies of uh, NATO, and uh, of course the moral principles it keep on advocating to the world and keeping its partnership with India in this region as well? How it's going to be balanced out? How it is going to be playing out for Pakistan? So, Mariam, I agree with Brigadier Saab here, like that. The U.S. is now at a very awkward situation. Mm. 
they have like played up India as a bulwark against China so much in the last like one decade that it, they have like now been placed at a position in which their own allies are questioning, you know, the U.S. stance now. I was like uh, reading a lot of like Western publications, and they were also criticizing the muted response of the U.S. Right now, they did like come out and they basically said that you should cooperate with the can Canadian authorities, but you know it has been always like a challenge for the U.S. because they have invested so much. A lot of like U.S. Uh, uh, corporations, we were also discussing this earlier. They have like invested heavily in India, and they want to like prop up India's economy, their defense and their capabilities to counterweight China. So it's very difficult and awkward for the US to take a very clear stance. And this is like damaging US credibility in the region and in front of their allies as well. Now a lot of like countries will basically say, okay, now if we have to, uh, countries have to settle, settle their personal issues, they can do it in outside their border as well. And this is against international law. And now uh, uh, in the previous question as well, there are like four main interests that the Indian intelligence agencies pursue across the world, and especially in Western countries. The first is that they basically keep a very close surveillance on Indian diaspora, which is pro-Khalistan or pro-Kashmiri. So they basically keep a lot of surveillance over these uh, you know, elements. Other than that, they do perception management, mm -hmm. and in perception pan management, they downplay India's like rising like mistreatment of the minority. Mm, that is the reason border. that we did not see much, uh, you know, things uh, against India even after these developments. Exactly. So they basically have media. a very strong media, mm. and we should like you know admit this that they do a lot of like propaganda, and we have the example of the EU dis disinformation lab that was churning out propaganda against Pakistan. So that's also one of the elements of their intelligence agencies. Other than that, they work very diligently in undermining Pakistani and Chinese interests in Western countries and they basically the audacity is that they basically say that they're like a lot of human rights uh, you know uh, abuses in China and Pakistan other than that they basically work very diligently in basically convincing Western capitals to suspend Pakistan's military aid and aid in other areas as well and now unfortunately we see that their ambit is expanding and now they have like included ex extrajudicial killings in their mandate as well and this is like a cause of concern and very worrying for a lot of like countries mm. especially the western capitals mm. of course uh, this is a cause of worry for western capitals as well as for the neighboring countries as well uh, dr jaspal the li uh, the rise of extremism in india has always uh, been an issue but uh, in this present uh, indian government uh, this has reached an other extreme uh, how do you think that the neighboring countries should be addressing this issue of course because this is going to destabilize the region as well and uh, let's talk about the divisions within indian society as well i think that uh, you had rightly pointed out uh, that there are divisions within the society manipur is still very much there there is a sectarian there is a communal there are many viruses within the indian society and that have a spillover impact on the regional or india's neighbor as well so region is very much vulnerable to the due to the india's hindutva policies but at the same time i would like to add it that the indians the soft power image or India's this uh, image has been all tarnished and the Western powers and especially NATO members members under the Article 5 of the NATO Charter, they are compelled to condemn India and support Canada on this. One has to keep in mind that that's the reason Americans, despite this, their desire to not change India or criticize India, they have to do it. So the situation is, uh, no world is facing as well as we as the neighbors of the India are facing. It's very dangerous and the Indians need to be tamed uh, by the international community and checked in this context. My final point on this issue is that if you see that within India, there is a state terrorism, Kashmir, Manipur, Christian community, Muslim community, the international community was deliberately ignoring it. Now, when they, this thing happened within their own homeland, now the Western powers are very much concerned. And certainly, if they are unable to stop India from this kind of a thing, the entire region will be in a uh, problem. And at the same time, the many other states will be in line. Because if you see, as I pointed out earlier, Australians are very much concerned. Britishers are very much concerned. So uh, the Indians have been exposed. They are this extrajudicial killing on the uh, you can say territory of the others and within their own state has been now exposed so it's a time to curb these actions of the india and criticize and hold back 
Right, of course. And uh, uh, Brigadier Malik, uh, Indian diaspora is of course spread worldwide. How, uh, how is uh, Indian diaspora going to be engaging with the host countries uh, to protect their religious uh, freedoms and of course uh, their rights that, has been that are being violated in, in India and now on other countries' soil as well? Uh, what I have seen in the international media, the reaction of diaspora being reported is that it is basically in two different directions. While uh, the peace-loving diaspora of India, which is basically the Muslims, either Sikhs or Christian, they are advocating that there should be certain limitation or extra killings, and there should be uh, the responsible attitude shown by the Indian intelligence agencies. And they think that this sinister mindset of the Indian agency is not going to go well for the image of the secular India. Mm -hmm. Whereas, on the other hand, the Hindutva activist mindset in the diaspora also, they are threatening the peace-loving diaspora of uh, the Indian population. And they are not only threatening uh, verbally, they are threatening for the physical and they are saying, giving them life threats. And I think this is again will be a challenge for the Indian diaspora world around, especially in uh, Canada also, where the Sikh community is in um, large number. Mm -hmm. and Even in United Kingdom. Also, but uh, what we see that the diaspora is again divided. And it is, a, I think, a litmus test for the Indian diaspora also, and the for peace-loving Hindus also. And if they feel that there is a, some kind of secular mindset among the Hindus, it should be shown now. Because any killing, whether it is based on uh, extra dueling mindset or otherwise, should be condemned world over, and human rights. But what we see in India also, that the Hindu mindset has also pressurized and blackmailed the peace-loving Hindus also to subjugation. Yes, the and same the voices in within India are also being not tolerated at all. Of course, they don't allow the peace-loving Indians to even wave, raise their voice against mm -hmm. such uh, terrorist and criminal mindset and sinister mindset activities by the Hindutva activities. What we see there daily, there are lynching of Muslims by the Hindu activities. Christians are being burned. And these six are being terminated. Earlier also, we see, I have seen the fate of the Bindrawala. It was just a separate, I think, mo freedom movement, which was being taken as a criminal activity and the people have been killed. And now also what we see, Musewala has been killed. It of was course. a simple, innocent True. person who was just mm -hmm. having some support for Khalistan. And now the Hardim saying 50 bullets on a person. I think this is too mm -hmm. much inhuman attitude which is shown by the Indian and diaspora also has not raised such wise. We don't see large population coming out and supporting that Hardeep Singh murder is a criminal activity and should be condemned. And I think this will be uh, again a litmus test, test for the point. Indian mindset if they are secular by nature and they want that there should be some uh, respect and right for every human being hmm. and it should be shown now. Right, of course, uh, Indian diaspora in other countries al also divided, Mr. Sharyar, uh, but uh, the threat of uh, extremism is uh, transnational. How should countries or the international community should be uh, responding to these threats and what kind of mechanisms is required? So, uh, Mariam, first of all, rule of law and effectively countering uh, this whole incident according to international law is very necessary. I would also uh, take example of like various other incidents that have happened across the world and I would basically say that you know if India does not cooperate the international community should collectively pressure India and they should be forced in the international uh, court of justice even mm. to basically be a part of this investigation. I think all the proofs that uh, Canada has they should be made public so the world actually knows what exactly is like going on and how Indian agencies are basically impinging on like sovereignty of like other uh, Western countries. We also have to keep in mind that the world is now feeling the heat of what Pakistan has already been advocating. True. You know, initially, you know, uh, uh, Pakistan had like a lot of examples. Pakistan shared a lot of intelligence dossiers even with the United Nations of India's role in perpetrating terrorism and Pakistan's boundaries. Now the West is also feeling the heat. And now if the collectively the world doesn't like come together and hold uh, India accountable, this will like continue, this will like not stop. And now as the, this like right wing sentiment in India is like expanding beyond the borders, the world should be concerned. Mm -hmm. International human rights obligations are a must for all countries. And you know, India should not be held above 
all of these international conventions and international you know rules and regulations just because it has a vibrant market or it has to be you know uh, pivoted against a rising power you know so there are like some things that are beyond economics there are some things that are beyond uh, strategy or like geo strategy and the world needs to realize that of course the world uh, needs to realize that but dr jispal what is the way forward keeping in mind all this these developments uh, how should pakistan uh, align or evolve its own uh, foreign policy uh, to leverage these uh, recent developments what the shakar has very rightly pointed out that the conventions and all these kind of the things must be used pakistani diplomats shall take initiatives at all the international or naps i mean by wherever they are serving by national forum and highlight this issue not only they just they do not simply criticize the india but they try to justify through the argument through the, these documents that what india is doing and at the same time there is a need to convene uh, you can say some kind of a converging forum between the pakistanis or among the pakistanis australians canadians and other like minded nations which are victim of the india india's the state uh, sponsored terrorism and highlight it at the various forums if you recall pakistan had submitted this uh, india one dossier in the united nation and there is no need to ask or convey you can say convince the canadians that they shall also submit similar dossier at the uh, united nation so that the international community not only realize but there must be prioritize about the india's anti state or state sponsored uh, the de uh, destabilizing policies of course thank you very much dr zafar nawaz jaspal for joining us in today's program uh, thank you very much a senior analyst brigadier hamid malik for joining us in today's program thank, thank you very you. much uh, mr shahyar khan for joining us in today's program uh, of course as uh, we conclude today's program it is evident uh, that these recent developments of uh, closure of afghan embassy in india and also uh, this chilling uh, uh, incident of killing of uh, sikh independence leader on canadian soil has set the stage uh, for a complex web of uh, developments and of course this is a time for reflection for india uh, to cater and address its extremism and fascism mindset and how it is going to be dealing with world and also its neighborhood of course this has uh, consequences and ripple effect for regional security as well that's all from game changer tonight take care allah hafiz <laughs>